So today, because it's February, we're going to focus on, you know, the subject of love, but particularly love in marriage. And that's why the theme of our topic tonight is myths and truths about marriage. The reason why many marriages fail because they come into marriage sometimes with the wrong ideas about what marriage really is all about, okay? And that's why we would like to discover what are the myths that need to be corrected and what are the truths that we need to stand on so we'll be able to have a better marriage, especially with our spouse. For those of us who are single, can you raise your hands, please, all the single guys? Okay, great. This is a very good preparation for you. And if you already have a girlfriend and you're planning to get married, uh, this is very, very relevant for you because this is definitely a primer <laughs> on primer on what you're getting yourself into, right? But for the other young men who are still studying, uh, you're still in school and you're still a little far, you know, uh, from really thinking about marriage, but you may have a girlfriend, you may be courting somebody, you will learn a lot of principles here of how a real man wins the heart of a woman. Okay? And so, let's take a look at the keys to making your marriage last for a lifetime. You know, the first myth that many of us have about marriage is that marriage, in marriage, love is enough. Okay? Many times when I interview a couple who wants to be married, often the question I ask is, now why did you choose this person? And usually the answer, oh, because he makes me happy. Remember I shared with this, this with you before when you talk about uh, how to love a woman. How many of you were here when we talked about how to love a woman? Okay, quite, yeah, almost 50%, okay? So this is like a part two of the topic, okay? So, you know, when I ask this couple, I say, why did you choose to marry this person? I mean, there are other guys out there. There are other women out there. Why particularly this man and why particularly this woman? Usually the answer is that there are many things that per he sees in this person or she sees in this person that makes him feel happy, makes him feel secure, okay? So it's usually qualities or things the person did that touched his life or made him, you know, feel that this guy really loves me. Okay, and so that's why we want to get married. So my question is, do you think it's because this person makes me more happy than any other person, therefore that is a good ground for getting married? Is that the right ground for getting married? Okay, why do you say no? Okay, because the premise upon which the marriage is being established is that you make me happy. Right? We enter marriage because we're committed to make another person happy for the rest of our lives. We marry because we love the person, not because we want love. Of course, we also need love. But the primary reason why we get married is because we're entering into a lifetime commitment to make that person happy. Okay? So marriage is not about me becoming happy first, but rather me committing myself to the happiness of this person. And so, you know, as you know, the first five years of marriage begin to, you know, uh, pass, you know, sometimes you start, married people start with trying to make the other person happy, but someday down the road, sometimes the orientation changes. Later on, we, we tend to become more concerned about me being happy in this marriage. And so what happens, we tend to start complaining about our spouse, we tend to find fault, and later on, because there's more focus on what's wrong with the other person, the marriage begins to break down, okay? Because we are now losing the very purpose of that marital decision. I married you because I'm committed to make you happy. And it's very difficult to fulfill that commitment if we don't have that conviction in our heart and that character that we need to sustain that kind of commitment for the rest of our lives. And the commitment to make the other person happy is regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the changes that may, we may see in each other. It's unconditional commitment for better or for worse until death do us part, okay? And so, is love enough? Well, it takes more than romantic love to make a marriage work. It's not even about compatibility. Uh, there are some men who come to me and say, but you know, you know I, I have to test out with this girl, you know. If we don't try to live together first, we won't know if you are compatible enough to get married. So live in muna. And so as we live in, then we'll discover if we're compatible or not. And then after that, then we get married. Okay? 
So that's a common that's a common argument by people who want to be sure that when they get married, you have the right compatible partner, right? Okay. But for us Christians, we recognize, of course, if you live with a woman without, you know, exchanges vows before God, we know that's living in immorality. And the Word of God is very clear about that, okay? But is compatibility the most important thing in a marriage? Is compatibility the most important thing in marriage? It is important, but it is not the most important thing, okay? Let me share you. Success in marriage is not determined by compatibility, but by commitment. Okay? A marriage works not because two people are compatible. A, mar a marriage works because they are committed to make it work. Even people who are compatible, sometimes the differences at certain points in their experience may far outweigh their compatibilities. Especially with something to do with character and habits. Okay? So you might, may have a lot of things in common with one another, but sometimes it is those habits that oftentimes become a cause of regular friction between a man and a woman in marriage, right? And sometimes those habits that you just cannot stand in the other, stand in the other person, later on becomes what? The source of irritation in the marriage. And that's why in the end, what makes a marriage last is not because you're compatible, but because you're committed to make that marriage work and we'll find ways to make it work, okay? God defines the man's commitment in the marriage in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5. This is a law that God gave in the Old Testament to the people of Israel. But uh, sadly to speak, uh, not everybody pays attention to this command, even in Israel, okay? This is what the Word of God says. A newly married man must not be drafted into the army or be given any other official responsibilities. He must be free to spend one year at home, bringing happiness to the wife he has married. Wow. I think every wife who will be there at the back will be very happy to hear this, right? And just wish it's happening. <laughs> okay. You see, in ancient Israel, it is your highest privilege to be part of the army. Because that's the army of Yahweh. The army of the Lord of hosts. The God of Israel. And so, when you are in the army... You know, if you are, when a, when a battle takes place against an enemy nation, usually you will be separated from your family from three months up to three years. And usually take around three years for a siege when, you're, when, you're, you're, when your nation's army is laying siege to another nation in order to ensure its defeat, it will take around a minimum of three years. And so you'll be separated from your wife for a long time, from three months to three years. And if you're serving in any official responsibility in the kingdom during the time, and the kingdom is at war, it's the same way. It's like you're one of the soldiers. You can go, get, go back to your home. You have to stay on duty for as long as the battle rages there in another country. Because your country, your kingdom, has to be vigilant against any enemy attack. Okay? And so God said, if you're newly married, you better get a leave from the army. Get a leave from our official responsibilities and for one year, one year, stay at home with your wife and focus on making her happy. So what are the implications here in terms of God's view of marriage? He's saying, I want you to develop the habit in one year of learning to put the happiness of your wife above your own. Because if you can build that habit for one year, it will be a habit that will be with you for all your life. And when you have the habit of putting your happen the happiness of your wife first, that is your one you know, way to avoid falling into adultery. Most men who fall into adultery are more concerned about their happiness and forget about the happiness of their wives. Most men who fall into adultery are more concerned about their happiness and forget about the happiness of their children. He doesn't even consider how this will impact his children and generations to come. He's more concerned about, I have to be happy. You understand that? That's why God said no for one year. You only focus on one thing, make your wife happy. That is my commandment. Because that is the only way that you can keep yourself from falling into adultery because you've developed a habit that you will carry on for the rest of your life. That even if I am not as happy with my wife, I will still commit myself to her happiness and find ways to make my marriage work.
Okay? And so, that is, God defines what kind of commitment we must give to our wives. So, you know, for the young men, how many of you are singles here? Can you raise your hands? Okay. Wow, there's a lot of them. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you know, one of the ways you can develop this even before having a girlfriend or, you know, getting married is your mom. If your, ha your mother and your father are fighting all the time, that means both of them are no longer happy with each other, right? But you can make a lot of difference if you can just make your mother happy in whatever way. Because when a woman is not happy, everything is affected in the home. Everything is affected, right? <laughs> but if you make your mom happy, try to find ways to make her happy, you'll be contributing somehow to the improvement of the marriage. Because a wife needs to ventilate all her frustrations. If there's just too many of that, there will be no end to the fighting. But if there's more feeling of consolation and comfort from the children that enables a woman, your mother, to balance, you know, her perspective in the family and, you know, because she feels affirmed and loved by the children, at least that is a buffer for her, you know, to keep her from really getting heavy and hard against the husband because she feels loved by the children. Okay? That's good practice for you guys. <laughs> Start with your mother, okay? You know, many people enter marriage with what they call a fairy tale syndrome. That's why in my pre-marital counselings, I would always tell them this. You know, many people when they get into marriage think they're entering into a castle of their dreams. Wow, especially for the woman, right? There are wives here at the back. Do you agree when you first decided to marry your husband? You know, because you love him so much and finally you're getting married. He proposed to you, you know, in a very dramatic way. And then you said, yes. <laughs> and then finally, you get to the wedding day and how do you feel as a woman? It feels like, wow, I'm getting into the castle of my dreams. This is my dream, right? Okay. Well, the fact is, getting married is like entering more into a construction project <laughs> rather than a castle, a ready-built castle, okay? Why? Because marriage is about work. When you get into marriage, you're starting a construction project where both of you have to work on that marriage and together begin to build the castle of your dreams together. Okay, it takes the two of you to build that castle. One cannot do it alone. You've got to work together. And you must be willing to adjust, make the necessary, necessary changes so that you will have a better relationship with each other. And later on, you'll, as you mature in that relationship, later on you'll have a very happy marriage. Okay? And so it means a lot of work investment before it can bring the returns of a satisfying and fulfilling relationship. You know, we men... We men, okay, not women. <laughs> we guys. <laughs> you know, as men, because we are designed by God to be performance-oriented, our hunger is to achieve, right? And once we achieve, we feel we have conquered, especially the heart of a woman, right? So during the courtship, we put out our best, you know, best front. You, you're not a very thoughtful person, but suddenly you become very thoughtful. You're not a poet, but one day you suddenly begin find yourself writing poems. You know what romantic love does to men? It brings out the best in them, right? Right? You might hate to walk you know, a, long, a long way, but you know because you love that girl who is around three kilometers away, you're willing to walk three kilometers for the first time in your life because you're inspired by your romantic feelings for this girl, right? And our desire is to win the heart of this woman, right? So we'll do everything to win the heart of the person. And then finally when he says, yes, victory, I have conquered. And so the marriage takes place. And after the wedding day, the arms are now laid down. And gradually, as the years go by, the wife begins to, take, to be taken for granted. Because now the man is looking for new worlds to conquer. I've conquered this woman. She's now my wife. I'm happy about her. And you know, we're enjoying our life together. But I have to conquer something new now. I've already conquered what, something I want. And so sometimes the work, the job, the business becomes the new world to conquer. You're always trying to find 
achievement. We don't feel meaningful as men. Our significance is based on our ability to achieve things. But once we achieve something, sometimes we begin to take those things for granted. And that's the time when the marriage sometimes begins to decline in, your, in the intensity of your commitment to your spouse because you have a new, you're finding new worlds to conquer. Okay? So that's why we need to recognize that courtship, as often has been said, does not end in marriage. Courtship is a lifetime process. You never stop courting your life. That's why God said for one year, do everything. Be creative. How do you make your wife happy? Okay? How many of you have seen the movie Fireproof? Oh, glad. I'm happy. There are many who have seen that. You know, there are very simple steps in how you can express love to another person. And you need to be creative. You know, just, you know, prepare a cup of coffee in the morning. You've never done that before. You know, or one day, you know, just buy her that that uh, piece, you know, that piece in the kitchen that is already old and, you know, it's already wearing out. And you're thoughtful enough to buy her a new one. She was planning to buy one, but you, you know, you anticipated it. And when she receives that gift, wow, I was planning to buy one like this. Well, I thought about it. I mean, that's, you, you, your wife really fall more in love with you because of your thoughtfulness. You know, sometimes just write a letter one day out of the bed and say, I just love you. You know, in everything that I, I may be busy in my work, but I, will, I always think about you. Or sometimes, you know, you go, go, go back home one day with just a, one rose. And one rose is enough for a woman because that re tells her that you remembered her. Little things like this make a marriage last for a long time. These are love actions love is not just a feeling it is something you do you have to plan how do i make her happy i have to plan the ways one i'll buy there it is two i will do this i will you know help her in the washing of the clothes or i'll help her in the washing of the dishes you know or i'll uh, first time when we go to the grocery i'll be by her side inside the grocery instead of going to another place when she's in the grocery I just want to make her feel just special to me. And what interests her, I would like to be part of it. So practical steps that you work on to always make your wife happy, okay? So it's a work in progress. One major reason why marriages fail is that most couples expect their marriage to work out successfully on its own, even without putting a lot of real effort to make it work. Just because you're now married doesn't mean your marriage will automatically work out all right. No. No. Doesn't work that way. In marriage, nothing is automatic. If you don't work on it, one day you can lose it. Let me repeat that. In marriage, nothing is automatic. If you don't work on that marriage to ensure it will be strong, it will be happy, one day you may lose it. Okay? It's a commitment for a lifetime. Most married couples do not know how to make their marriage work. By default, we don't. You know why by default we don't? If you came from a family where the marriage of your parents were not very, you know, ideal, maybe dysfunctional marriage in your parents, our tendency is to carry over into our lives the failed patterns of our parents because that's all we know, right? And by default, you know, if, if you have um, parents whose marriage is really, wow, awesome, well, you're one of the rare people, when you come into your marriage, you have a lot of good things to put into your marriage, okay? But most of us, by default, we don't know how to make a marriage work, okay? We simply carry over the failed patterns of our parents' marriages. You know, I often ask also people who want to get married, would you like me to share with you a good picture of what marriage looks like? Of course, they say, yes, pastor. Oh, uh, look at your parents' marriages. How does it look like? And some of them, sometimes they begin to frown. Oh, <clears throat> you mean, Pastor, that's what marriage looks like? Yeah, it's possible. And sometimes they think, do I still want to get married? <laughs> if that's the kind of life that we will have, just like my parents, <laughs> okay? Well, that's what's going to happen if you don't work on your marriage. It's a commitment, okay? 
it takes more than love to make a marriage work. Success in marriage requires more than romantic feelings because romantic feelings rise and fall like a tide. They rise and fall. Sometimes it's also hormonal <laughs> for a woman, right? It also requires what? Genuine spirituality because if you don't have a strong relationship with God, in those times of weakness, in times when you're so discouraged in your marriage and you don't know what to do, and you just want to, you know, just explode and, you know, try to find, you know, your own uh, outlet. And sometimes the outlets are not really the good ones. Without a strong relationship with God, it's hard to remain faithful to your marriage. Very hard. And without a relationship with God, you won't have the wisdom that it takes to handle those sometimes difficult conflicts that you have with your wife. If you're a man of prayer, God can give you wisdom to see you through what you're going through. You need to have genuine spirituality. Romantic love is not enough. Another thing, we also need to have knowledge. You know, there are so many books, there's so much literature on marriage written by Christian authors, and we can learn from them, okay? We can also learn from seminars like this, workshops on marriage. So that's why I congratulate you that you're here tonight. You're listening to the seminar. This can help you improve your marriage or help you prepare yourself better to be a great husband one day, okay? So it, it demands knowledge, motivation for learning. In marriage, when you stop learning, sometimes that's when the marriage starts failing, okay? Because we do not, cannot presume we know everything about how to make a marriage work. That's why you should never stop learning from others. The other is communication skills. By default, we don't know how to communicate effectively. There are some habits in communication that we have to unlearn and we have to develop the better habits in communication. Like for example, we tend to be more critical, especially when we're, we're frustrated with our spouse, we tend to be more critical than encouraging. Communication skills tell you that if you want to encourage a person to develop in a certain area that is bothering you, the best way is to encourage the person rather than criticize him. So can you say this to the person beside you? Instead of criticizing, why don't you encourage and inspire? That's communication skill. You understand that? Or learning to correct your husband or correct your wife without creating offense. That takes communication skill, right? You know, if there's something that's really hurting you in the way your wife treats you, if you don't know how to communicate and write, you can make it worse, right? So of course here there's also the layer of culture. Of course, American culture, they may have a different way of communicating that properly and more effectively than us Filipinos. But here, you know, if we're going to correct somebody, be sure to affirm the person first. And be sure you have not been a cause of frustration to your wife in the past days, okay? And then affirm your wife, make her feel happy. Do something to really make her happy. And then approach her with the pronoun we and us rather than you. You say, you, you are like this. You are doing this to me, you. You know, just the finger already hurts, you know, you. You're attacking your wife. That's how she feels. Rather we can say, you know, I'm really concerned about something in our marriage that's really hurting, particularly me, and, and I know I care about our marriage. I think we can, we can do better, but I would like to share what I'm struggling with, and I need your help. I need your help in this because I want us both to be happy. Is it all right if I share with you one area where I feel a little disappointed? But I assure you, I'm sharing this because I care enough for our relationship. For us Filipinos, you know, for that, also our Americans here, we have to go that path. Because in our culture, people are more relational. One of the big differences between American culture and Filipino culture is this. In American culture, truth is more important than relationships. 
In Filipino culture, relationships oftentimes are more important than the truth. Let's not talk about it because when you talk about it, we fight. So let's not talk about it. But that is important in the relationship. In Iwasan ang away. I don't want to argue with it anymore. But that's important. You, you don't want to argue because you want peace, right? You want harmonious relationships. And that's why when we confront a person or correct a person, we have to do it gently. Affirm the person. Build a bridge first between your heart and the person's heart. And when the person is ready, then deliver your request. But do it by making your wife feel, this is because I care about our relationship. And I know you can help me here. So don't make, don't make your wife feel as if she's the bad guy. Rather, make her feel, I know you can contribute to our happiness. I need you. I need you here. Okay? So that is communication skill. So having a romantic feeling for your life is not going to make your relationship successful when during times of conflict, you don't know how to communicate effectively. It takes a skill to communicate right. Okay? So communication skills are important.